lecture today uh, basically the introduction uh, introduction to the cryptography area uh, and why we need cryptography and some basic theories of cryptography uh, meantime i will also show you some applications where you may feel how those cryptographic applications work uh, so cryptography is simply some kind of art uh people scramble or kind of uh, change their data into some meaningless <laughs> format from the meaning full format where then others may not be able to see or others may not be able to get that particular data so when you do that we need to be careful on various things we will discuss that when you move on uh, basically crypto systems with the crypto system we try to achieve several security requirements uh, what we call it as integrity confidentiality and so on i'll discuss that when i move on uh, so basically this cryptography is kind of foundation uh, that means with uh, a foundation for whatever the Based on other information security facilities. So then there is an area called crypto analysis. Uh, crypto analysis kind of uh, area where people try to break the cryptography. Uh, that means they try to kind of uh, find it out the information uh, from the hidden text. So when you get together cryptography and crypto analysis. we call it as cryptology so that is very basic introduction or the definition uh, for the subject so the uh, main objective of the cryptography is to, uh, to achieve several security requirements as i mentioned foundation of information security is basically the cryptography the requirements what we try to achieve or the, our main objectives are uh, achieving data integrity confidentiality authenticity and some requirement what we call it as non replication so so when i move on i will see how the cryptography achieve each and every requirement little bit of these requirements data integrity refers to unauthorized alteration how do you detect unauthorized alteration confidentiality refers how to stop uh, accessing the information authenticity refers to how do you uh, authenticate the people that in how do you know exactly who are they and non repudiation refers to collecting uh, legally valid evidence where yeah, people may not be able to repudiate their action so even though we discuss cryptography today cryptography started very long time ago i will do some history for the cryptography as well when i move on uh, basic uh, when when you think about the basic concepts of cryptography there are two kind of cryptographic concepts available we call it as symmetric key crypto system some people call it as single key crypto system others call it as asymmetric key crypto system some people call them as public and private key cryptography so Uh, when you want to use those cryptography in practical application we have to combine those several systems together when you combine those several systems together we call it as hybrid encryption systems uh, let's start discussing cryptography from little bit of history so basically uh, before i do that i want to introduce kind of term where i use on uh, throughout this lecture so some of you already familiar with cryptography i know some of you perhaps very new to this area because of that uh, since i have no feeling about the knowledge variations of my audience uh, i i would like to assume all of you are kind of people who don't know about cryptography so with this stand i try to deliver this course so because of that i want to introduce new terms and the basic process of cryptography in the cryptography area whatever the human can read and understand for it has a plain text so for example this is plain text uh, so some people confuse when we say plain text 
because it is uh, it has a word text uh, so in the cryptographers or cryptography people would like to use that word uh, the plain text means any information in electronic form where a human understand so that means it may be sometimes a picture sometimes a video what i want to highlight is when i say plain text it doesn't mean always it is a text it also some some information right which human understand so then cryptography has a process called enciphering which basically convert this plain text into the unreadable format what we call it as a cipher text so this process is called encipher or some sometimes we call it as encryption so basically we uh, we convert our plain text into the cipher text by using the process called encryption so this encryption process use some set of algorithms so those algorithms are called as cryptographic algorithms or the cipher algorithm so so then we have human unreadable data that usually call it as a cipher text and also we can call it as encrypted data so those encrypted data we can convert back to the human readable format so that reconversion process usually call it as a decipherment or the decryption so this decryption also we have to use algorithm so those algorithms again we call it as a cipher algorithm so usually in the symmetric cryptography algorithms we use the same encryption algorithm for the decryption as well but in some cryptography our encryption algorithm and the decryption algorithm are two different algorithms so basically you know we have some plain text our intention is to basically hide them so we pass to the algorithms called encryption algorithms or the cipher algorithm then it becomes a cipher text so then if you want to ask them back we pass them to the cipher algorithm again we will get it back the plain text so this encryption and decryption process we also use some kind of sacred input to to uh, to do this uh, handle this uh, to operate this process so this sacred input we usually call it as a security key it's kind of a password which shared between the uh, data owner and kind of like a person who access the data towards the end of the day so that is the basic uh, process of any uh, cryptographic uh, application so as you see in this basic process there are two important operations what we call it as enciphering or encryption and then deciphering or decryption and both use encryption and decryption we have to use what we call it as a security key sacred key so those sacred key is the key or the whatever we need to keep sacred in between these two parties who do encryption and the decryption why we need to have encrypt uh, encryption obviously firstly you should understand so the encryption will convert the human intelligible information into the unintelligible format so that is it we convert plain text or some books call them as a clear text into the hypertext so by in this encryption and decryption process so why we do so to provide the confidentiality to to provide the confidentiality of the data so in addition to the confidentiality we could use these cryptographic algorithm to achieve the integrity and other security requirements we will discuss those in other lecture as i mentioned cryptography started very long time ago so it, it's not started because of the computer science even though we use it for computer science for the computer science algorithms and application uh, but cryptography started in long time ago so one of the basic principle in the cryptography call it as kirchhoff principle in this principle basically we say in the cryptographic algorithm should be public and what we need to be keep sacred is the security key so i'll discuss that towards the end of this lecture as well so there are as i mentioned there are two cryptographic systems we will discuss so they are what we call symmetric key and asymmetric key 
in the symmetric cryptography system, there are two sacred we uh, so there are two keys we use, what we call it as public key and the private key. Among these two keys, actually we have to keep private key only on the sacred. So when you use symmetric key encryption, we use the same key for encryption and the decryption both process. Because of that, uh, we have to use that same key that is our symmetric key sacred. Uh, so, but in the public key system, there are two keys in use. Only one key need to be key sacred. So those things I will uh, explain to you when I move on on the uh, other lectures. In the business perspectives, cryptography has a lot of business application. For example, if you want to store data in the protected form, we need the cryptography. If you want to prevent uh, repudiation, we need cryptography. If you want to identify unauthorized authorization, we need cryptography. If you want to communicate between the two endpoints, like web server and web browsers, we need cryptography. If you want to kind of uh, uh, set it up secure or encrypted uh, IP channels, that's also we need cryptography. Our crypto system, main all of the crypto system. Uh, there are four major security requirements we try to achieve using cryptographic system. So I repeat those, I already mentioned. So those goals are confidentiality, authenticity, integrity, and non-repudiation. Confidentiality refers to actually confidentiality, make sure unauthorized parties cannot access the information. Authenticity, make sure the correct party is accessing them. Uh, integrity makes sure unauthorized alterations, uh, stop unauthorized alterations, and non repudiation refers to collecting electronically valid evidence during the uh, whatever the data transferring and especially payment, uh, electronic payment process. Right. Objective of the lecture today is to give you a brief introduction to the cryptography and to discuss the history of the cryptography. There you understand how those cryptographic algorithms work in very basic format. So then later on, we will move on to the modern cryptographic algorithm, and we will learn how to use those cryptographic algorithms in our application programs. The early cryptography basically refers to the, the Egyptian tribes, which are actually some pictures, kind of like, uh, uh, into the uh, pyramids and things like that. So it's not really a cryptographic algorithm, but it's kind of a cryptography where people may really doesn't know what it is unless otherwise they know the meaning of this picture. So the kind of the first cryptography, two algorithms which uh, documented, uh, there are two cryptographic algorithms documented. Uh, in the world. One is the Julius Caesar cipher, or what we call it as a Caesar cipher, which um, may be used by the Julius Caesar in the Roman Empire uh, at that time. They, they, he, it, it, they, they, it's a very simple cryptographic algorithm. The other cipher is called as a Kama Sutra cipher, which basically used uh, or documented in India uh, somewhere around again 4,000 years ago or something like that. So these are the two major historical cryptographic algorithms we are we interested on. And after that, there was a cryptographic algorithm whose somewhere around the first Cold War period. So it was invented in somewhere in 1882 by a uh, by a person called Frank Miller. And after that, uh, there was a newer version variant in, introduced by Lyman uh, Wernham. It's called it has a Vernum type uh, cipher one time pad or the OTP cryptographic uh, system. So, from the historical cryptographic algorithms, which I mentioned here, uh, the Vernum cipher or the one time pad cryptographic algorithm is the algorithm we still use. It's modern computer science, maybe after 100 years now, uh, as I mentioned from 1970, uh, binary Vernum, uh, so over 100 years now but we still use. So we will show those uh, historical cryptographic algorithms first in detail, how those algorithms work. 
after this first volvo uh, cryptography also used during the second volvo as well uh, so some of the machines used by the germans was very interesting so those machines call it as enigma machine uh, enigma machine uh, so those machines uh, basically used by uh, hitler uh, to do the uh, to communicate during the second world war period uh so that uh, machine was broken by british that means they have found the cryptographic algorithm behind that there were several movies and then there are some novels written about how those enigma works and how it was broken and so on so so that is another historical cryptography algorithm uh, unfortunately we could use that machines anymore so the modern cryptography started somewhere around 1970 so with the algorithm call it as well des data encryption algorithms after that uh, in 1976 a person called a uh, two person called dc and martin helman introduced the cryptography uh, concepts called public key cryptography algorithm so that algorithm called it as the dc helman cryptography algorithm that changed the world that algorithm basically changed the people who think about it so before 1976 so we use only the symmetric key encryption that means we use only one single key shared between the senders and the recipients after 1976 so this public key cryptography or the modern new cryptographic concept started so then somewhere around 2000 uh, there was a cryptography algorithm introduced uh, by the us government to the world called the uh, advanced encryption standard or the aes so this advanced encryption standard or the aes is the person standard of data protection or the encryption so we will learn little in detail how those uh, a desk work aes work dp uh, helman work rsa work so rsa is another public key cryptography algorithm and there is a one called elliptical cryptography algorithm or ecc like that so though we will learn those algorithms uh, when we move on on the in this lecture series so let's start the historical algorithm hieroglyphs are the first kind of cryptographic algorithms uh, created by uh, egypt yeah, people it's not really the algorithm they just use symbols to hide their ideas so people who knows only those symbols may understand those ideas so that is the basic uh, how the cryptography started then the, after that so the so there was uh, documentation and stories discussed about how caesar used his algorithm uh, for their the, during the roman empire or famous empire julius caesar how they used it in his communication so this very famous algorithm it called it as the caesar cipher i will let you know why we can't use that cipher any more in the modern era uh, but for the historical purpose and to understand how those cryptography work uh, let's discuss those algorithm in detail the caesar cipher uh, so in order to uh, describe this algorithm i am using in english alphabet maybe actually he says his own alphabet different alphabet so in this uh, uh, basically in the cryptography area while we write in that so the notations we use are very important we, are, we might use it throughout this lecture series so whenever we say p it refers to the plain text so that means the human readable data so when i when i say p i it basically i position of the plain text Uh, so basically so you see there is a pi and then there is a letter called e so letter e call it as encryption algorithm so in this part what it says we apply the encryption algorithm e to the plain text pi so that what it says so after we do what happens we get it back the cipher text pi so algorithm e convert the plain text ci to the ciphertext ci uh, so that is it 
uh, meaning of that. So now let's uh, look at what is E. E is described here. E here E says E I plus three has been the shift in the position of the letter. So it says uh, a plane text I position of the plane text is re, uh, shifted by the third position of the letter. So let's take we use English alphabet to execute this digital cipher. So we have these uh, letters in the, our message to be sent. So if you, whenever we see letter A in our message, that may be replaced by the third portion of the letter, that is B, C, D, letter D. So similarly, if you see letter B in our message, that would be replaced by the third portion of the letter. So then letter C will with letter F like that. So all the letters will shifted by the third position of the letter in the same alphabet. So that is Caesar cipher. Uh, that is the simple Caesar cipher. So as as you understood, I say it replaced by the third portion of the letter. The three is what we call it as a key, security key. So people can chain that key. So for example, this um, user can agree with one commander to communicate with number three, with the other commander to communicate with number four, maybe number 10. So that means if the first commander, he may shift it by third position, second commander with the fourth position, maybe the third commander with the 10th position. So he changed the key. So the key is the secret between their uh, communication parties. So, the, uh, so that's how, is uh, managed to uh, control half of the world using this sacred communication method. So as you may understand, this is what I discussed encryption. So that is converting the data into the different format. Then how do you do the decryption? Decryption is the opposite. So that means getting back the data. So if we, usually the decryption we represent by letter D, not E, Letter D, so when you apply letter D to the plain text CI, we can, we should get back the, uh, sorry, letter D to the ciphertext CI, we should get back the plain text PI, right? So what would be then decryption algorithm here? So as you may understood, decryption algorithm should be uh, CI minus three. And if our encryption algorithm is PI plus three. If you generalize it PI plus key, so when you do the decryption algorithm, it is C i minus three. If, if you generalize it, C i minus t, right? So that is how this cycle works. So that is very simple encryption algorithm we had in the history. Then there was a other interesting algorithm, uh, which uh, recorded by a very well famous book in India called Kam Sutra. So that book basically explained to the world uh, how we do encryption and the decryption in a different way. So this is, uh, 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 they, 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 you know, like in this particular book, which, uh, uh, which uh, is the book which says uh, some uh, 64 arts, which basically women know about. Uh, so among those arts, uh, basically 44 and 43, as I remember described, the cryptographic algorithm. So, so that means this book says all the women in the world should know some sacred methods to communicate with their partner. So this book explains what that method is. So it's interesting method. Uh, let's try to understand how that uh, cryptography algorithm works. So also you should remember the algorithms we discussed invented 4,000, 5,000 years ago, there were no computers, obviously. So they did everything manually. So in this algorithm, the uh, says, so if you want to use this algorithm, so you help of it, you have to divide into two parts. So I am again using English alphabet as an example. Uh, so in the English alphabet, we can randomly divide that alphabet into two rows. So that is, considered as security key of this algorithm. So we have to share this key between the sender and the recipient. So so that is the secret we need to be keep, both parties has to keep. So after that, let's say we want to encrypt some information. 
So this is the information we want to encrypt. Let's say this word we want to encrypt. That means we want to convert it into the format people may not read, understand it. So in there, we do the encryption and decryption by taking one letter at a time. So let's say letter K in this word first. We pick that letter first and replace it with the opposite letter. That means we replace K with I. Then we take the letter A, we replace, we find the A, where is it here? We replace it with the Z. Then we take the next letter on our plain text, so that is M. So we look, okay, M is here, we replace with O. So then we search further, okay, A, A is here, replace with Z. Okay, we have S, there is S, uh, S is here, it will be replaced by N like that. So that is our encryption process in this. So obviously, the uh, so then this is our plain text and this is our ciphertext. So our recipient will receive the ciphertext with this key. So then recipient will basically get the decryption. How the decryption works uh, on the same method decryption works. So the, uh, they pick the first letter of the ciphertext and they search the key, uh, this letter I appears here. So this they replace letter I with the key. All right, so like that. So then they replace, uh, they see the uh, plain text, uh, a cipher text. Then they say next letter is Z. Okay, Z is here in the key. It replaces with the A. Okay, we get the second letter. Like that. So we use the same table and then same method to get back our plain text back. So that's how uh, this particular uh, cipher, what we call it as Kama Sutra cipher works. Right. So this kind of, uh, as you may understood, C is a cipher and those, this other cipher uh, do the encryption one letter at a time. So when you do the encryption one letter at a time, so those kind of encryption, we call it as monoalphabetic substitution cipher. Those monoalphabetic substitution ciphers may never work in the present context because of these following reasons. The reason is every letter or every alphabet or the every language in the world, you know, there is alphabet. So when you analyze the letter frequencies of any alphabet in the world, so there is a common frequency. So for example, if you get an English book, and count the letters in this particular book, highest counts get by the letter E. Letter E is the highest frequently used letter in English alphabet. That is a known fact. So similarly, letter Z is kind of the lowest frequent letter used in the English alphabet. So like that, there are known facts in the every alphabet in the world. So when you take uh, some other alphabet, Arabic or Tamil alphabet, so similarly there is a most frequent letter. So how this uh, thing uh, used to break this cryptography, monoalphabetic cryptography algorithm? It's very simple. So for example, let's say I have access to the ciphertext from someone. Yeah, I don't know the key, but I want to break that uh, ciphertext. What I have to do is, I collect the ciphertext for a period of time, so then analyze the frequency of the ciphertext. When I analyze the frequency of the ciphertext, if I get highest frequent letter in this particular ciphertext as letter D, then I should understand, okay, this person replaced letter E with letter D. That's why D gets the higher frequency. Then I know how many positions we shift that. Then I know which table we can use to replace those letters like that. So because of this known pattern, known, the known frequencies in the English or whatever the alphabet in the world, uh, we may not be able to use the monoalphabetic substitution cryptographic algorithm. I, in other words, we may not be able to use these the cipher or the constant cipher for our application. So after people realize this fact, uh, letter frequency, 
And so they were thinking about met new methods, new methods where they can overcome this problem. So one of the early methods they used to overcome this problem is to use two tables. That means two keys in one single encryption. So in the odd position of the letters, they might use maybe a one key, and the even portions of the letters, they might use a different key. Uh, so then there are two keys used, uh, one to odd position, one to the even position. If you do so, so letter E may not always replace by letter D, maybe something else in the uh, odd portion of the letters. Only odd portion of the letters E may replace by D, even portion of the letter, letter E may replace by some other letter. So because of that, if someone analyzes the frequencies of the cybertech, they may not get the highest frequency for the place where we replace E. So that is to some extent good, but we may not be able to use that method as well nowadays. We have to use uh, some modern algorithm. Then after 100 years, I said, so there was the algorithm developed, one we call it as one-time pad. On those one-time pad algorithm, people use some pad, letter pads, or in other words, some books to do the encryption and decryption. So the books usually used as random numbers. In these algorithms, what they, what they do, they use the message, and then they do kind of uh, add the key to this message, and then they do mod 626 operation. So in case of English alphabet, if you have different alphabet, this modular is different. The number of letters in the alphabet, so if N, then the, we take mod N operation. Like that. So then we will get back some number. So we get the equivalent number in the, uh, in the alphabet, and then create the ciphertext. Uh, so I will explain that in detail in a minute, but uh, hold for right now. So basically the idea of one-time pad is, is to kind of share a security key between the sender and the recipient. And that key uh, shared as uh, manual pads, random pads. So those pads had random text. So we use those random text as the keys for the encryption and decryption purpose. So for example, if I detail it, let's say we have some plain text here to be encrypted. We have to represent this plain text by some number, maybe starting from zero or starting from one. So this is the example start from zero. And then we have to add some random number. That is what I mentioned, like, like the letter in the random pad. So then, uh, so we add them together, 21 add to the 76, we get 97. And then I am using uh, example with English. So this modular is 26 because English alphabet has uh, 26 letters. So then we get some 97. So we take the modular operation of 97, modular 26. So the answer is 19. So then we try to find the equivalent number represent the 19. So if you start giving numbers to the English alphabet, starting from zero to A, one to B, two to C like that, 19 is assigned to the T. So then we replace it uh, with T. Similarly, letter E, we represent by a number that is four. If you give letter number zero to A, then one to B, then two to C, like that, then uh, three to D, and then four to E, like E four. And then we add some random number here, and this is 52, then take modular 26, so that is zero. So the zero represent by the A, so we replace A. So this is our plain text, and this is our cipher text. So people we do all this operation manually. So that used by the say, first world war. How they, how they use it? So they use the Bible as the random pad. 
so those uh, these european uh, soldiers they have to carry the bible to their uh, battle fields so though they use the letters on the bible to create those kind of numbers before they go into the battle fields they agreed the page on the bible saying okay i'll talk to you with page number 10 i'll talk to you with page number 5 like that so this then they uh, they used the letters from that particular page as the key to do the communication so that's how they do the uh, encryption and decryption in this one time pad so one time pad further developed to a to a, to a vernum cipher so it's the vernum cipher basically is a binary version of the one time pad so in the you know the in computer science every data finally it in the binary form so like zeros and ones so let's say our in the binary vernum so how it works so all our plain text need to be converted into the binary format so if you have some message Uh, assume this is the binary version of this message so then in order to do the encryption we need to have a random data so this size of this random data must be equal to the size of the plain text so that is only the condition main condition of this encryption algorithm we should have the random string which is size must be equal to the plain text right so then our encryption is simple binary operation o operation x operation so you know in the binary uh, operations uh, so in uh, you you and uh, you i believe you already learned there are few binary operations available but equal o and exclusive o not like that so the vernum cipher use exclusive operation x operation x operation you know when you do x o 1 1 is 0 1 0 is 1 0 1 is 1 0 0 is 0 in x operation right so that the binary vernum cipher algorithm x o is the algorithm so for example let's see this is our plain text to be encrypted so this is the random string key which we use so then we do the encryption that is simple x operation so you see 11000000110101011011110 like that just x operation so then recipient will receive the cipher text that is uh, uh, again a binary string so then what the recipient should do recipient do the decryption in order to do the decryption recipient must have the same string so same random string right so then what is the decryption algorithm same x operation so let's try to do the decryption now this is ciphertext decrypted with this random string so how it works 0 1 1 0 0 0 0 1 1 1 0 1 1 0 1 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 
So using those, we are, what we generate is true random numbers, true random numbers. But practically, when you implement the cryptographic algorithm, we, sometimes these true random some numbers are not practical to be used in our application. There we have to use what we call it as pseudo random numbers. Pseudo random numbers are generated by mathematical functions. So those functions basically have some input values. So for example, here I am given one function called a multiply ri plus b modular n. So then a, ri, b, and n all are constants. So we, those constants or the, sorry, fixed values, we give it to the algorithm at the beginning, call it as a seed, seed value to this algorithm. So we can have initial seeds. So when you give initial seeds to the algorithm, it will generate the first random number called ri. So then we can put ri with those seeds and we can get a second random number on this, like r1, r2, rc, and so on. So like that, so in the pseudo random generators, usually have initial value. So using this initial value, we can generate a sequence of these random numbers. So this sequence of the random number always depends on the initial value. Also, there is another property of this pseudo random generation that is actually after some sequence, those pseudo generators start to repeat. So that means the same sequence is generated after some time. So that is a bad property of the pseudo generator where we may not be able to eliminate. Uh, in the true random generator, we may get the entirely true random numbers. So in the pseudo random generators, we get the kind of random numbers. But so if after a period of time, so those random numbers usually repeat. So because of that, because of that, some attackers may collect the ciphertext during uh, over a period of time, and they might use that information to find it out the repeated patterns, and those repeated patterns may lead to break those cipher algorithms. Because of that, we usually test it's re kind of, it's, there is a high risk of when you are using pseudo random numbers. However, Practically, as I mentioned, we still use pseudo random generators and use those random numbers together with the Vernon cipher uh, in Wi Fi communication. So, in the Vernon cipher, the most challenging part is generating the random numbers because in the Vernon cipher, we need the key equal size of the plain text. So, that we have to generate the numbers. Otherwise, we have to remember those long keys. That is not practical and not possible. So we have to use uh, pseudo random generator. Right. All the algorithms we, we discussed so far actually use one letter at a time for encryption. Uh, but most of the modern algorithms, we are not using one letter at a time. We use the bulk of the letters. That means uh, more than one letter at a time for encryption. There is a reason for that. I will discuss that reason in the middle uh, at the minute. So one of the early uh, historical example for such algorithm is called columnular transposition. There was another historical algorithm called Fenn cycle. So those algorithms are example of using more than one character at a time at the encryption and the decryption. So in order to understand how such algorithm works, let's try to ad understand historical columnular transposition cipher. So in this cipher, let's say we have a plain text called geeks for geek. So that is our plain text where we want to encrypt. So for that, we have to use a security key. Assume our security key is this, hack, right? So, so we using this security key, we, de we derive two things. One is the number of letters in the key. So number of letters is equal to the number of columns in this encryption algorithm. And then the order of this letter basically take it as a sequence. You may understand what it is in a minute. Okay, so this is our key. So we ordered this key based on the order in the alphabet in this particular language. 
so a you know the first now letter in the alphabet then c is the second and then obviously the third one is if you uh, order it then the h is the third one and the k is the last one so we pick the key and we put the one two three four whatever uh, based on the c order of this uh, letter on our key right so then we are ready for the encryption so then we take the message we want to encrypt what we try to do is we write this message sequentially so for example we write here first column g and the second d third d this g and then there is a s and then space and then f o r space and g back space like that so we write our entire message to this columns how many columns you we write uh, depend number of columns depend on the key the number of columns equal to the number of letters in our key right after that encryption is actually read it through the columns so for example so we first we read the column with the first letter that is e a that is column second column actually we take the second column first so we pick e two space k e two space k then we go to the c okay we pick e f g s like that right and then to this and then to that like that so what we do we basically write the our message in this order and read the message in the different order in the through the columns right so if you want to decrypt them back so we have to we we, have, we get this table back and then put those letters and then read through the rows like this here we we can reproduce this message so it's entirely manual process you see if you want to do such encryption and decryption we need to have entire message together so that kind of encryption algorithms we call it as a block cipher so in the previous one like one bit at a time or one character at a time encryption algorithms we call it as a string cipher right so these block ciphers whatever the encryption algorithm in the world or what we call cryptographic algorithm in the world we can divide into these two groups what we call stream ciphers and the block ciphers stream ciphers will do encryption at one character at a time or the one bit at a time block cipher will do the encryption entire block at a time so the block size sometimes the entire message size sometimes sometimes block size is the fixed block size like maybe eight character maybe 16 character like that when you think about in detail those block ciphers and the stream ciphers we may be able to identify their own advantages and disadvantages try to and um, let's try to understand the stream ciphers the stream ciphers we do plain text encryption one character at a time and produce the cipher text the main advantage of that is is the speed so that means e soon as one character is available or one bit is available we can transmit or we can do the encryption in the stream cipher so in other hand it has the low error propagation so that means after encrypt we transmit this data if something goes wrong at the middle that effect only to this particular character so it not effect to the other character uh, that is in some other word a disadvantage that that call it as has special to the malicious insertion modification that means let's say we are using a stream cipher uh, to communicate between the atm machine and the bank so somebody understand okay this part of the message has a count number so then what attacker might do attacker might click a bit at the middle of the transaction so middle of the transmission so then if that bit may be read back to the different number into the other end so then that number may be a different account so then the money will go to the different account so like that so this is really dangerous to use stream ciphers in financial 
contraction because his insertion attack might be possible. So, so similarly, uh, so there are other disadvantages with the stream cycle. We call it as the diffusion. We discuss the diffusion in a minute. Uh, so let's go to uh, the block cycle. Block cycles work one block at a time. That means we have a fixed set of data plain text to be encrypted. So then it produces a fixed set of the hypertext. So main disadvantage of that actually, as I mentioned, so those cycles are slow comparing to the stream cycles. So because we have to wait until the data block is ready. So that I, we say these block cycles are not really suitable for real-time communication, real communication, like voice communication or the video communication. And also, block cycles have high low error propagation. That means if something goes wrong while transmission the cyber text, at the middle, entire block has to throw away because entire block may not be decrypted at the other side. So then we have to retransmit that data block. That to what we call high error propagation. So these are the disadvantages of the block cycle. On the other hand, advantages are they are, they are good diffusion. Uh, I will let you know what it is in a minute, and immunity to the insertion attack. That means if someone wants to insert the data, uh, that is not possible because if they insert it, entire block gets corrupted. So because of that, uh, so people, other side people, Recipients understand, okay, someone tried to transfer the data. So that is uh, an advantage of the drug cipher. It's immune to the insertion and it has the property called diffusion. Uh, so in the practical application, we use block cycles and stream cycles, especially in the real-time communication. <coughs> we heavily use stream cycles. If the other other encryption and decryptions like bulk encryption, decryption, financial transactions, we use block cycles. So far, you, you remember we uh, studied several cycles: columnar cipher, Vernon cipher, is the cipher, one-time pair, and so on. Among them, uh, only the columnar cipher is a block cipher. Rest of the cyphers, all of them are a stream cipher. Right. So basically, if you have kind of a, uh, uh, if you have a cipher text, so uh, someone want to break it, that so these people may uh, what you call crypto analysis. So those crypto analysis. Basically, they try to break the ciphertext and try to understand what this message are without knowing the key. So, so, so those when you want to kind of uh, uh, do such a uh, thing, basically sometimes they they have to they should they know the algorithm. Sometimes they don't know the algorithm uh, when they want to break those. Uh, so basically. So in theory, I will also discuss towards the end. So algorithm, we should be algorithm always available. So we should basically put algorithm available to everybody. So what our secrecy is the key. So in algorithms should be developed in a way it is computationally invisible to find it. So that is the main requirement in either block or the stream cycle. Hi. In addition to that, so somewhere in the 90s, a person called Shannon uh, lists down high properties or five characteristics of a good cipher or the, some uh, encryption algorithm should have. So in, in, in his uh, theory in the first line he said amount of secrecy needed should determine the amount of labor appropriate for encryption and decryption. Shannon refers to the labor because at that time in 1949 we didn't have computers. We used the labor humans to be do the encryption and decryption. 
So if someone want to break that algorithms, they need to more humans to be work with that. So that's why they refers to the labor. His statement even correct today. So today we refers to the computer power. We say the safety of the algorithms is actually amount of the computer power required for this kind of encryption and decryption. And then uh, in the Shannon uh, says uh, this encryption algorithms and the decryption algorithms should be free from complexity. So he said in 90s or 1940s because the, at that time this encryption decryption handles manually. But still that is valid because if the algorithm gets complex, it, when you get when you want to program it, it gets complex and so on. Still we refer to have simple algorithm rather than complex one. One of the simple encryption algorithm even we use today, I mentioned exo operation. And then uh, in the third property, Sharon says uh, this cryptography in, uh, implementation process of this cryptography algorithm should be simple as possible. So even as you understood it correct today, because implementation need to be simple because we are using those algorithm in devices and so many de uh, places where we have we should be able to implement it very fast. And in the fourth characteristic, he said. Uh, error need to be proper. Error should not propagate. So obviously that is correct even today because when you do transmission, if error get propagated, we need to use high bandwidth and so on. So error should not propagate. And then Shannon further said, size of the plane text should also equal to the size of the uh, cipher text. That is also correct because. Uh, if the size gets changed, we need more space to show this plus more bandwidth to transmit that. So we still prefer having the plain text size equal to the hypertext size. But when you study the modern encryption algorithm, you may understand that is not true. Most of the modern encryption, our hypertext sizes are larger than the plain text size. So these five. So also at the beginning, I discussed about the uh, uh, principle called Kirchhoff principle. So this principle is also very important principle even today. So it says security should not achieve through obscurity. That means we should not hide the algorithm. I repeated that statement several times even like today because hiding the algorithm, we may not be able to achieve the secrecy. Even though we hide the algorithm, some crypto analysis may found that after he found that it's very difficult to change our algorithm. Uh, let's say we don't hide the algorithm, we publish the algorithm, we, but we hide the key. If you do so, if someone found the key, it's, it's very simple, we can change our key. In, in the practical scenarios, changing the key is so simple than change in the algorithm. So we said, don't hide the algorithm. So we let the algorithm publish, then the ex experts can review that. If there are problems they can identify, then we can correct the algorithm. So then everybody knows the algorithm, then everybody can communicate. Our secrecy depends not only the algorithm, it depends on the key. So we can keep the key secret. As I mentioned from the symmetry key set of algorithms, some set of algorithms, we have a, one single key which we need to keep sacred between the sender and the recipient. In the other category of algorithm, we have two keys. One key we need to be keep as sacred, but the other key we can keep as a public data. So we will discuss those in other lectures. Right. So when you design a cryptographic algorithm, there are two major principles where should be achieved, but we call it as confusion and the diffusion. So using those confusion and the diffusion, what we try to make ciphertext is very, very complex uh, data set where, some, uh, where the crypto analysis may not be able to hide it out the plain text back. That means we destroy all the properties of the plain text 
all the statistical properties, all other properties of the plain text by using our algorithms. So then the ciphertext may not have any relationship visible with the plain text. So then uh, that is what the confusion and diffusion process do. So when you think about the confusion, con confusion defines as interceptor should not be able to predict what changing one character in the plain text will do to the plain text, uh, do to the ciphertext. That means if someone change that character, if we can see this will change, then we see this character has a relationship to that character. So then like that, a script to analysis or the person who try to analyze this ciphertext may identify sometimes relationships between the plain text and the ciphertext. If they identify such relationship, so with that, they could be able to break those cycles. So we say, so those relationships should be completely destroyed. In order to do that, we need to use the property called diffusion. In the diffusion property, what we try to do is information of a character, we try to distribute throughout the plain text. So we take the information of this character we distribute it throughout the plain text. That means the information of that hided entire plain text. Information of that will be hided entire plain text like that. So in order to do that, our cipher need to be a block cipher. If it is a string cipher, it's one to one. So one character maps to that. So then it has no confusion, plus it don't have any diffusion. So that's why I say if you use stream ciphers, there are no diffusion, that is not good. Because if there are no diffusion, and cipher analysis people may see this is one-to-one, -one, then using that, they can derive some information, so those information can be used to break the cryptographic algorithm. So we, most of the modern ciphers are block ciphers. Why they have block ciphers nowadays? Because those block ciphers have more diffusion. Diffusion means block ciphers hide the information of those characters throughout the ciphertext, not only in one single letter. So that is kind of a, a main requirement of uh, block ciphers, uh, uh, main requirement of cryptographic algorithms. That also call it as a perfect secrecy. So in, if you don't have that, what we call it as imperfect secrecy. So in the imperfect secrecy kind of, we have one to one or one to kind of few relationships. If the perfect secrecy algorithm, this one will hide it throughout the cipher. This character or the bit, bits of this character will distributed throughout all the cipher text. So then if you do that, it's called it as a perfect secrecy. So diffusion achieves the perfect secrecy. That's why all the modern ciphers are block ciphers. With the strain ciphers, we cannot achieve the perfect secrecy or the diffusion. So there is another requirement we consider while we uh, defining or developing the cipher. So that's usually called it as uh, meaning and meaningless messages. So for example, we have the different same text. So we use some keys and it encrypted to let's say one single ciphertext. If this one single ciphertext, when you try to break it back, if it comes to a di different set of plain text, uh, then some attacker may not be able to identify which plain text it really means. Right? So if you can have such redundancy while developing a cipher algorithm, that much better. So then. Uh, even the attacker decrypts that, the attacker will decrypt based on the key actually. They try different keys. Uh, so because the attacker have access to only the C1 ciphertext, they might try randomly or somewhere. They try it and they get one key and it they decrypt to this C1, P2. Then the attacker might think, okay, that is the plain text. So actually that is known. So it has a different message, but attacker gets the other message. So that is called redundancy property of encryption. And if you have more redundancy, it's much better to understand that. So similarly, if attackers, or what we call it as cyber analysis or crypto analysis, uh, so when they want to analyze the cryptography, 
they sometimes has only have hypothesis to work with sometimes they have partial plain text as well sometimes they have hypothesis and plain text both in their hand sometimes they know only algorithm and the hypothesis in the most of the cases crypto analysis knows the algorithm and the hypothesis because the algorithm is published and they get the hypothesis and then by using this information they they try to reverse it in the most case in case they have only the hypothesis only so they they have to find it out the algorithm by looking at the hypothesis and then they have to break it so it's kind of difficult and then if they know plain text and partial hypothesis uh so that's much better they have more information and then chosen uh cybertech prefers that they have kind of a no about the algorithm and they they can put non inputs and find it out the non non output uh, and then try to break the key based on that information similarly uh, uh, chosen plain text attack these are the different uh, uh status crypto analysis may work with however any cryptographic algorithm of the world is vulnerable to a brute force attack or what we call it as brute force search that means crypto analysis can try all possible combination of the security keys so for why so because all the cryptographic algorithms have the fixed size of the key so they have kind of maybe a, a 32 bit key maybe 56 bit key like that as a uh, sub cryptography algorithm use 56 bit key that roughly equal to the 7 byte parser so so all those keys in finally in the binary format so because of that this 2 to the power 56 is the maximum number of keys what we can have we try every key one by one and one key should be the key which the sender use for the encryption so one key should match so we try all possible combinations with regular computers trying this much of keys you should understand 10 hours even though it 10 hours it says it's less than that so because of that so all the cryptographic algorithm people can try to brute force so if we want to stop that we have to use the higher keys yeah so for example recommended key size actually now over 256 bit so even though i say it's 168 bit it is so this is with a regular computer but you know we have the fast gpu machines now uh, uh, boards available kind of distributed boards available uh, distributed computing platforms available with those fast machines and the platforms networks so breaking 168 bit key also take uh, kind of hours so because of that usually the key size now recommended key size of any cryptographic algorithm nowadays is 256 bit key uh, so we have to use larger keys if you don't use larger keys what might happen someone will do force our cryptographic algorithm because of that we say it the cryptography what we achieve is computational security our algorithms are modern cryptographic algorithms are computationally secure algorithms that means uh, with the present computer power this algorithm may be secure when the computer power increase this algorithm may not secure that means the algorithm secure today may not secure in 10 years time so for that we need to have new algorithms but there are set of algorithms in the world but we call it as unconditionally secure cryptographic algorithms so one of such unconditionally secure algorithms category is called it as quantum cryptographic algorithms practically we are not using those quantum cryptographic algorithms uh, for uh, practical cryptographic purposes but the quantum algorithms are already implemented in the laboratory levels those quantum cryptographic algorithms this when people say when quantum computers appears in the market so those quantum cryptographic algorithms we have to use quantum cryptographic algorithms uh, so those quantum cryptographic algorithms do not depend on the computer power so the the cryptographic algorithms we use today are computationally secure algorithms 
with that i i will conclude the lecture part